Hello, and welcome again to Controversies in Church History, the podcast that takes you through the most interesting, important, and controversial events, ideas, and persons in the life and history of the Roman Catholic Church. Welcome again. My name is Derek Taylor, your host for the podcast. Remember, you can find this podcast on social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter, <clears throat> uh, and on the web, uh, churchcontroversies.com, our website. You may also find us on YouTube, our YouTube channel, uh, as well as we do have a Patreon page where you can, you can donate if you like. You can still just listen there for free. <clears throat> All the podcast episodes you will eventually listen to for free. If you sign up for the Patreon account, you get some stuff early and without ads, because I do have ads on the uh, uh, on the podcast. So, <clears throat> and again, welcome. Welcome to Controversies in Church History. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, been uh, a week or two since I got one of these episodes out. And so I have one here, and I'll, I'll detail what's upcoming at the end of the podcast if you're new here. <clears throat> this is another review podcast, uh, this time of the film Beckett. And last time I did a review on A Man for All Seasons, which is a sort of famous Catholic movie. This one's less famous. Uh, Catholics know a little bit less about this, less about the figure of Thomas Beckett than Thomas More. And so I'll go through this film. Partly, I want to do this next part because I just, I love this movie. I think I probably like it better than A Man for All Seasons for reasons I'll explain. But uh, it's, uh, Beckett is the, if you don't know, is the film about St. Thomas Beckett, the medieval martyr. Uh, who is murdered uh, defending the church uh, and its integrity against uh, King Henry II of England. <clears throat> we'll get into this in a second, but the film that came out in 1964, two years before Man for All Seasons, it won several Academy Awards, uh, and it stars, uh, the main stars are Peter O'Toole, the late Peter O'Toole as uh, King Henry II, and then uh, Richard Burton, the great Welsh actor, uh, as uh, Thomas Beckett himself. So a little bit of background, if you don't know, this is a little less familiar, I think, than the Thomas More story. So we'll go through this first for people who don't know. Uh, Thomas Beckett was a Londoner, uh, born to um, merchant parents, and he remained proud of being a, a Londoner for most of his life. He enters the church. Uh, he's born in 1120, by the way. So this is the middle. It takes place in the 12th century. And um, uh, enters the uh, service of the church, particularly the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, a guy named Theobald. And eventually he becomes a protege of, of, of the uh, archbishop. <clears throat> He'll be ordained an archdeacon. And with that, I'll mention this is important in a second, uh, comes revenue. As long story short, these, these positions in the church in the Middle Ages came with lands and therefore rents from lands that were very valuable. And Theobald eventually recommended him to the king, Henry II, when he became king. King Henry II becomes king in 1154. I'll explain why that's significant in a second, but uh, he immediately takes a liking to him, and within a few months, he makes him Chancellor of England, gives him a high post in government, at which he excels. Uh, Beckett's a very capable person, and, um, and he becomes wealthy as a king's courtier. He uh, lives the life of a wealthy courtier, while still retaining, by the way, his position as Archdeacon of Canterbury, partly because of the revenues that come with us. This draws criticism from people in the church, uh, from churchmen who were reformers. It's also one reason um, contemporaries, including the king, are shocked at his transformation when he becomes archbishop. When he becomes archbishop, he begins, uh, he puts away all of his, um, famously, all of his uh, wealthy clothing and stuff like this. Begins living a very austere life. Uh, accounts uh, about his body after his death, after he's martyred, um, um, recall that he was wearing a hair shirt. A hair shirt is something that's chafes against the skin. It's meant, meant to give you pain. Um, it's a matter of asceticism at his death. So he changes. Uh, but this is the reason why you have this. He becomes this famous martyr uh, in the Middle Ages. <clears throat> now, um, early hagiographers make a lot of Beckett's, Beckett's relationship with the king prior to his uh, becoming archbishop. And uh, Henry II clearly favored him. They tend to, and for a long time, this has been the, the standard view, is that he was his boon companion. That's the phrase they use. He went out drinking and partying, which he did to a certain degree with, uh, with Henry II. And, um, but I think perhaps they've overdone this closeness. Um, and I, I say this because there, there are two major uh, biographies of, of Thomas Beckett, academic biographies. One's by Frank Barlow. I think it's done back in the 60s, I think. 60s, maybe 70s. It's a good book, kind of dry. Um, but a more recent one, about 10 years ago, by uh, John Guy, who is a Tudor historian, actually. It's written for a popular audience. Much better, much well, more well-written, much easier to read. 
he says you should be a little suspicious of that. I think he may be right. Um, I think because Beckett was a commoner um, was one of the reasons why, I just like me speaking, is one of the reasons Henry II must have raised him up so quickly. Is I think he maybe thought he was easier to control than a feudal nobleman. Um, Guy particularly tells this story. There's a story, and I can't remember the details of it, where I guess they're out hunting or something, and I guess um, the king takes Beckett's cloak from him, cloak from him, and refuses to give it back. And then eventually Beckett, you know, pleads with him and he gives it back. And this is usually taken by his early biographers as a sign of the king's favorite. See, he didn't. He could have taken his cloak. He didn't do it. And Guy said, you know, you, you probably see that a different way. You probably see it in a different light. That. You can almost see of him sort of putting a commoner in his place by even doing that sort of thing, by sort of, you know, you could see it as more humiliation than sort of favor. And the point is, I think there's something to that. I think Beckett, uh, you know, he's a headstrong person. Should say that right now. Both he and King Henry II were very strong personalities. It's one of the reasons that they came to martyrdom. But whatever the case may be, he served, Beckett served him very well, and so he promoted him on that basis. He probably thought he was getting his man uh, as the Archbishop of Canterbury. As you're going to see here, and let's explain this, why this is important, is he thought he was getting somebody who would help him control the church. The uh, um, one thing to know about uh, uh, England in the 12th century is that it was a great power, uh, and this will this will change in, in a couple of centuries. Uh, if you remember uh, the Dukes of Normandy, uh, well, William Duke of Normandy, William the Conqueror, had conquered England in 1066, and so the <coughs> excuse me, kings of England at this point are kings of England, they're also dukes of Normandy, they have extensive, extensive holdings in France, and they are technically subject to the king of France as, as feudal subjects, but they're usually wealthier, and in this period, often more powerful than the kings of France. And Henry II becomes king in 1154 after a time of civil war for several decades in, uh, in England, sometimes called the Anarchy, <coughs> by English historians. And he founds a dynasty, because he's from the county of Anjou, the empire, it's called an empire, it's called the Angevin Empire because he has holdings in France and in England. Uh, it's called Angevin because he's from the, the county of Anjou, but he begins the, uh, a dynasty that will last until the end of the Wars of the Roses in 1485, uh, which is called Plantagenet, so it's because he's French um, by origin. That's something to keep in mind here is it's a French-speaking aristocracy and monarchy in England at this point. And so the point is he's coming to the throne after there's been this, this civil war in England, and he's determined to make sure that the king's authority is respected everywhere and that it's dominant. And I say this because during the Civil Wars, when the monarchy was weak, the church in particular, <clears throat> its canon law courts, and the church has its own system of canon law, which was really important in the Middle Ages, in a way it's not now, uh, to the wider society, I mean, um, which during this period of Civil War had usurped some of the legal, you could say, positions or prerogatives or powers of the civil courts. And he wants to take these back. Now, this runs into the opposition of the church because there had been, <clears throat> going back to the, uh, the uh, 11th century, a reform movement, the Gregorian reform movement, which I've done a podcast on, so you should go listen to it, um, which, among other things, asserted that the church, because of, it was ordained you know, by God directly, was superior to laymen, uh, that clergy were superior to laymen, and that the church's government was superior to lay government because it received its power directly from God. And this is going to feed into Beckett and this conflict with the king because um, one of the things he will assert, uh, the, the, the asserting the church is, is that it has a superior legal jurisdiction over that of the civil, civil authority. And this will lie behind some of Beckett's assertions as Archbishop of Canterbury. In particular, this is one of the things that uh, Henry um, wants to get rid of, is that priests can only be tried by ecclesiastical courts. They can't be tried by the civil courts. And I should mention... The reason why this is controversial is because the, the penalties from these canon law courts were very light. You can commit murder as a priest, and the only sentence you might get might be being defrocked. Whereas Henry wanted to get a hold of these priests and execute them, which is one of the things Beckett wants to prevent. And I should mention, by the way, his position in the early 1160s is actually kind of extreme at the time, and it only becomes widely accepted by canon lawyers after his death, and partly because he was a martyr. So this is a controversial thing at the time. Anyway, what sets off, because he's made, uh, I should mention, Beckett's made uh, Archbishop of, uh, excuse me, uh, Chancellor in 1155, he's made Archbishop in 1162, <clears throat> but a couple of years later, uh, Henry holds a, a council of his bishops at Clarendon, and uh, they 
put together a document called the Constitutions of Clarendon, a set of regulations that were intended to take powers back from canon law courts and give them back to the king's courts. But these actual regulations went far beyond this. It wasn't just you know things like I just mentioned, the trial of, uh, of, of clergy and those sorts of things. It actually went beyond this. Uh, many of its strictures were without precedent. It was a, really was a power grab. This is the thing uh, John Guy's book was really good on. He makes it clear. Henry II actually had plans for the church that are kind of similar to those of Henry VIII several hundred years later. He really wanted to get control of the church. And so Becket opposes this. And in fact, in, not initially. Initially, he, he agrees with the other bishops to these constitutions, but within a year, he, he changes his mind, realizes this is going to really harm the church. And so he repudiates his oath, uh, and then Henry forces him to exile uh, in 1162. And for the next six years, he's in France. Um, the king confiscates all of his property, uh, as well as the property of his supporters, and drives all of his close relatives into exile as well. There are attempts at reconciliation between the king and Becket. Um, papal legates are sent there constantly for several years to try to broker a deal, but neither will budge. Uh, the bishops themselves are kind of divided, but there's a lot of them that don't like Becket. They think he's a traitor. They think he was someone who was raised up. He was a commoner who was raised up by the king, and he sort of turned his back on him. Uh, this is led by the bishops by a guy named Bishop Folliot of London. He gets into the film if you watch him. He's, he's portrayed as this scheming, jealous guy, jealous of, of Beckett's uh, success in the movie. Um, but they're hostile to him. And in fact, uh, there's, I won't go these in detail, uh, but there are mutual acts of hostility both by the king and excommunications. Beckett excommunicates um, several people close to, uh, to the king. And so this, this prevents reconciliation until in 1170, for whatever reasons, the two men meet in France and uh, the king allow, decides to allow Becket to return to England. When he arrives back in England, 1170, December 1170, he's hailed by the people there, which upsets the king. And so, uh, again, the, the actual how this went down is still uh, kind of unclear, but supposedly uh, the king uh, and uttered some angry words. The the words supposedly there is, "Will no one read?" Me? The, the words are supposed to be, "Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest?" And uh, supposedly, acting on this, uh, four of his knights went to Canterbury, traveled from Normandy to Canterbury, forced their way into uh, into see him uh, at Canterbury there, hoping to get him to lift the excommunications he'd pronounced. He refused. They followed him into the cathedral where after an angry exchange of words, and I'll mention this in a second, because the way he dies in the film is not like this at all, it, well, how it happened at all, uh, Beckett is apparently shouting at them, and that's when they pull their swords and hack him to death right there in the cathedral floor. And he becomes a martyr almost instantly. I won't go into that too much detail here. Maybe if I do, maybe I should do one on Beckett. I don't know. It's controversial, I guess, but it shouldn't be for Catholics, but <clears throat> um, they murder him, and he'll be made a martyr later on. So that's the story, uh, basically. Uh, of, of Beckett and um, so about the film uh, the film itself is actually based like uh, A Man for All Seasons which I'm going to compare it to here based on a play <clears throat> this time by a Frenchman named Jean Ennui um, which title in English is Beckett or the Honor of God it's a phrase that gets into the film as you'll see and a couple of things right off the bat he gets one big thing wrong right off the bat in the, in the play which gets into the film which is that uh, he has Beckett um, in the film as someone of, of uh, Saxon descent. In other words, remember you have the, the Norman Conquest, 1066, these Norman French conquer these <coughs> Anglo-Saxon English people. Um, he says in, in the film that he's an Anglo-Saxon. He wasn't. He was born to Norman parents. And the reason why, it's a we I read this, it's kind of uh, weird. Apparently he, started, he read a book about it and then started writing the play. He, he got like 15 pages into the play and then he found out the book was wrong, and he decided he couldn't change it for some reason, <laughs> which seems really lazy as a writer, I have to say. It doesn't really affect... Actually, I, in a way, it, it, helps the, it helps the film as a story, but it's totally wrong. Uh, one thing I've never been able to figure... I don't think this is the case. The, the play, I should mention, it was uh, published and performed first in, in 1959. And I've always wondered. He's French, and if you don't know, there's a, a crisis going on in France in the late 1950s over the... the uh, state of Algeria, which had been a colony of, of the French for over a century. And I always wondered if this didn't have anything to do with that. Nothing I could find says it does, but maybe it's in the background a little bit, I don't know. But you have this racial tension in the film, which has no basis. In fact, <clears throat> I mentioned the stars. I'm going to talk about the things I like about the film here. Um, I love O'Toole and, and Burton. They're great. Uh, you have two people, two actors, great actors at, at the height of their powers in some ways. 
Peter O'Toole had won the, the Academy Award for Lawrence of Arabia two years before this. In 1963, uh, Burton who had uh, appeared in Antony and Cleopatra with Elizabeth... Um, um, what the hell was her last name? <laughs> I can't remember her last name. The guy, the woman he married, the beautiful one, Elizabeth... God, I, I'm blanking on her name. You know who I'm talking about. Um, I want to say Elizabeth Hurley. That's not the, that's not the actress. Man, I'm, I'm getting old. My mind's going. I blame COVID. Uh, and anyway, but both great performances. Big stars. Uh, costumes are very good. I think they're, they look cool. I don't know how accurate they are, but they look great. Uh, the costumes look great. Sets are really good. It's filmed at Shepperton Studios in England, so it's, it's specific to that, <clears throat> that area. But um, one of the things, I'll, I'll talk more about this in a second, it's really good about the film. It's actually much better, by the way, I think, than Man for All Seasons, is the way they deal with religion in the movie. Uh, and one of the reasons they did so well is because they're actually advised by uh, monks my local abbey um, called Downside Abbey, which if you don't know, those monks um, just left Downside Abbey, Abbey last year. Um, there's only eight of them left. There were a lot more back in 1963 when they filmed the thing, but um, they helped them with some of the, I'll go to this in a second, some of the scenes in the movie, which are excellent. So big thing about this. And I mentioned I loved O'Toole and Burton. There are other really good performances in this. Um, Donald Wolfett plays Bishop Folliot. He's kind of great. He has a real great voice. You'll see, watch the, um, uh, we'll get this in a moment. He has a great voice, but he's the, he plays the sort of Bishop of London, who's the, an antagonist for Beckett. And then uh, Sir John Gilgood, the great Sir John Gilgood, plays uh, Louis VII, the uh, King of France, um, and does a nice performance there. The writing is very good. Uh, I, 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 I th still think it's maybe quite not as good in, in some ways as A Man for All Seasons, but it's still really good. It, uh, it actually won an Oscar for, for, uh, for its writing. It was nominated for 12. I only won a couple. Um, one was the, for Best... They didn't call it Best Adapted Screenplay back then. They called it Best Screenplay uh, taken from another genre or something like that. And as we're going to talk about in a moment, there's a big differences between the screenplay and the play. And so, and, um, and so that's one of these things here. Uh, the writing is very good. I think the screenwriter's name was Edward Onholt. And um, I have to say the screenplay is, I think is better both as drama and maybe as history too. There's one thing, one thing is better about the play. The play um, makes Henry II a lot more cynical, which he was in real life. Um, in, the, in the film, they make Henry II kind of, uh, you'll see this so you watch it, the, the beginning and ending scenes make him like, sort of almost not repentant but like he's sad he had to get rid of Beckett in order to have his plans you know for the church or whatever in real life there was no such thing uh, Henry II just resented him as a traitor and that's pretty much it so that's a little more accurate but uh, Anouy's play is much more cynical overall though and I mean the presentation well of religion um, the Pope the Pope in the film was actually made a little bit of a figure of fun but it's a little more light hearted the cynicism about the you know politics of the papal court and stuff like that but in the play it's all cynicism all the way down and in fact in the play the only religious person who's actually any way admirable is Beckett himself everyone else is either cynical or piously stupid or something like this they treat religion much more much more accurately but also much more respectfully in the film um, and Beckett seems like a weaker character as a result in the play because he just sort of in the play, there's uh, well, maybe one of the big differences. One of the great religious scenes in the film is where um, one of the things they changed uh, in the in the uh, in the in the film is that the uh, constitutions of Clarendon were the were the thing that made the break between Henry and Beckett in real life. That gets into the play. They mention them briefly in the play, but they actually they change the 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 event that splits them up into his uh, excommunic excommunicating a nobleman who kills a priest who's been accused of, of, uh, of rape or something like that. And I don't know why they did this, but in the film, they take the conversion of Beckett more seriously. There's a wonderful scene where Beckett's just gotten the, the word this priest has been murdered by this, by this nobleman, and he sends whoever told him this away. He goes, he kneels down before a statue of Jesus and has this really long prayer which Burton does magnificently, by the way. It was really well done, where he begs God to make him worthy of his office. And it's great. It's the conversion scene in the, in, the, in the film. There's no such scene in the play. All that happens is that he just becomes archbishop, defends the church, and he gets killed. <clears throat> and so it's much better psychologically in the, in, the, in, the, in the film than in the play. 
it seems to make him more fatalistic in the play for some reason, whereas in the film it's much more his choice. And um, just, again, overall, it takes Catholicism more seriously. Uh, I mentioned that there, there are basically three big religious scenes, the prayer conversion scene. There are two others which are awesome. Uh, one is the scene where they consecrate Beckett as Archbishop, and this is one of the things, scenes specifically I know the monks actually help them with. The scene's only about five minutes long, so the actual consecration would actually take several hours, but it gives you an idea of what was taking place, and it's wonderful. I actually I teach humanities courses at the community college where I work, and I actually showed my class. I was doing a, you know, talk, we're talking about ritual and rites of passage, and so I played them this, this, uh, uh, this clip from YouTube of that scene, and it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's just really, it's neat. You should watch it. Uh, there's that one. The other one, of course, is the excommunication scene where he excommunicates the, the nobleman who had killed this priest. And it's, it's hair raising. Like, Richard Burton really gets into it. He's like, you have to read it. Watch it. It's wonderful. So this is the best part, I think, of the film in many ways. And it's much better, I should say, uh, on this score than, uh, than was A Man for All Seasons, in my opinion. Uh, now, one last thing about this film, if you go watch it, which you should. Uh, obviously, I want you to watch the film. It's great. Uh, it is, is an older film. Uh, it's an older movie. It, again, like Man for All Seasons, comes from a different era. It's two and a half hours long, and it's kind of a costume drama. That's what, actually what uh, uh, Jean Ennui called um, well, one of his plays, Beckett and several others. He called them pièces de costume. They're costume pieces. And it's really slow. <laughs> the pacing is really slow. And about the first third or more of the film is basically taken up with background. And it's taken up with background, by the way, partly it's made up uh, by, by Ennui. And um, because the, the, the real start of the movie, the inciting incident, if you know that phrase, that's the that's screenplay, screenwriter talk for when the real, real conflict of the, of the movie gets started. And, and, and the, the inciting incident is when Beckett gets made Archbishop. It doesn't take place until like 55 minutes into the film about an hour into the movie, so it takes a long while. And they filled this up with stuff that, again, to get to the rights and wrongs of history in this movie a little more specifically, um, Henry II is kind of portrayed, both in the play and the film, as kind of a bore, uh, kind of deprecates himself as Beckett's inferior in intelligence, and this is totally wrong. Uh, Henry II was one of the most learned kings in, the, in middle, medieval Europe. Um, he had a scholar at his court for a time, a French scholar named Peter of Blois, and he wrote, a, wrote about his time at the, the court of Henry II. He talks about how he was the king of England was always doing something, always reading something, um, and always uh, you know asking and debating with his, his scholars at court. And he, I think the quotation I have here in my notes is Peter Bloss said it was school every day with the king of king of England. Um, he, uh, Henry was said to have read books at mass. He didn't like religion very much apparently. Um, and um, all this, by the way, this reading stuff and all this, this is very rare for medieval kings. They didn't do that in this period. Most of them, as portrayed in the film, are mostly concerned with fighting and, and hunting and stuff like that. It's also one of the reasons, by the way, that he is beloved, Henry II, of modern historians. Um, he was very serious about the administration of, of his kingdom, about his law courts. And that's, you know, modern historians, that's what they think government is. So that's why they like him. Um, his contemporaries didn't like that as much. Uh, they liked Richard the Lionheart. Why? Because he was a great warrior. <laughs> and that was the main thing. Uh, a king, but Ken Tepperberry just wanted a, a great warrior, which he, he kind of sort of was. He won some wars, but he was more of a, a real, <clears throat> you know, ruler in that, that sense. Another thing, minor thing, it probably gets di uh, slightly wrong is that Beckett is probably more physically like Peter O'Toole, kind of short and uh, thinner, whereas Burton's probably more like... Um, Henry II, a little broader, broad-shouldered and everything. <clears throat> the film begins with Henry II doing penance, uh, which he does in 1174 after Beckett dies. Uh, I believe he was flog he gets flogged in the film, but I believe he also crawls on his knees to the street of Canterbury. It was really extensive um, penance. He did have to do some stuff for it. Uh, one of the real silly things in the, pl in the play that gets into the movie is that, and this is part of the, the they're trying to set up the conflict between Beckett and Henry, and they, they can't just say it's over politics. I guess that's too boring. So Anui inserted this silly sexual rivalry between Beckett and Henry over a Welsh woman named Gwendolyn, who's supposedly a, a captive of Beckett's in some war. And in, in the film, 
There's this, and this is actually a good thing. This is actually a good consequence of Anui's mistake making Beckett a Saxon. There really is this like sense of of, of Henry II wanting c- to control him, um, which gets into the film. And again, it's not true. I don't think maybe to a certain degree it was, but um, in the play, basically the king basically says, "I'm the king. You have to let me have your your woman here." And and that's kind of in the film what happens. It, it makes the film weird because it, it there's no this didn't happen first of all and by the way Henry II didn't need to do that he was king and by the way Henry II had lots had mistresses he had you know there was no doubt about that in terms of uh, 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 who he was but it makes it really weird in the film because this character Gwendolyn whom the king you know takes or tries to take from from Beckett um, is played by Sean Phillips John Phillips was a Welsh actress who was actually Peter O'Toole's wife at the time. <laughs> so it's a little bit weird, just the whole thing. Uh, by the way, they later got divorced, and she's still alive, 90 years old. She outlived him. He's dead for many years now. <clears throat> and I have to make this preface this to talk about this, because I think I need to talk about it. Now, <clears throat> because in the film, one thing it might, I don't know if this will throw anybody off. Maybe it will throw you off the film. It shouldn't, but uh, you know, my audience is mostly conservative and traditional Catholic, so I understand it might, but I, I, when I first got the, I first got this film, by the way, because I, I was given it by my grandmother, who's not Catholic, and she had it as a VHS tape. And for you kids, the VHS tape is what we had before <laughs> before we had digital stuff and, and DVDs, just so that you know. Anyway, um, I watched this. I love this film. And, and I remember watching I was reading something about it. I, I think I maybe Googled it one day, and I was reading about it, and something came up. I was reading about the film. I read something about it that said there was a gay subtext to the, the movie. And I was, like, so horrified. But I thought, oh, this is so wrong. And, like, they're just doing this because it's Catholic and all this stuff. And, and I was deeply offended by it. And, um, but then I went back and rewatched the film. And I have to say there probably, <laughs> there probably is some gay subtext to the movie. Um, there are a couple of scenes. Um, well, in uh, a second. But first of all, Henry, the, Henry in the film is played by O'Toole. Uh, as Henry II, like a rejected lover. It's, uh, he gets emotional about Beckett all the time. He says, he, you don't love me anymore. It's really weird when, when you think. I didn't think about it the first time I watched it. Because, you know, then you have, you know, friendships can be that emotional too. But um, there are two scenes, looking back on it, that might have some of that in there. But they're both in the play. Uh, there's one scene at the beginning of the film where, um, where uh, the king has just taken a bath and Beckett is like, washing his, like he he takes a towel and, and dries him off and there's a little bit of that like okay I can see some of that there maybe but especially one scene at the end of the movie and I'll have to explain this this is uh, after Beckett's this is in the story after Beckett's gone back to England and Beck and uh, Henry II's in Normandy and he's with his mother who by the way the Empress Matilda was his mother uh, he had a good relationship with his mother so this is another thing that's wrong in the movie in the movie they fight all the time but in the film he's He's doing all these things to get back at Beckett, and the emperor, his mother, says to him that um, in the play that you have this uh, rancor that, that is that is unhealthy and unmanly about this guy, and that if Thomas Beckett were a faithless woman, you would act no different, right? Now in the play, that doesn't sound like much, right? Just saying he's excessively angry against him. They change this in the movie, um, and what it says in the movie is you have an obsession. What she says is you have an obsession with him that is unhealthy and unnatural. And then if Thomas Beckett were a faithful, faithful woman, you would act no different. That seems to suggest there is some, some sort of subtext they're getting at here. And I mention all this because the two major biographers, both Frank Barlow and, um, and uh, John Guy, they have tried to pin homosexual tendencies on Beckett for whatever reason. I don't know why. Probably because all the hagiographers say he was chaste. We have no evidence. He, By the way, when he was... Uh, Lord Chancellor, and he did hang out with the king. There's no, there's no evidence he he frequented prostitutes or anything like that. So I think they're suspicious. They all come up with nothing, by the way. Um, I mention all that because what's weird about the film is that they're portraying really Henry II as having this obsession, which might might be kind of you know, be some homosexual tendencies there. There was no way Henry II was that in real life. Uh, I think my, 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 my reason why I'm bringing this up, uh, partly because it's, you know, it's controversial. That's, what, that's the nature of the, the podcast. Um, I did find out about the film, however, uh, that the director, Peter Glenville, was in fact uh, homosexual. And he actually lived with a partner for the most of the rest of his life. A man who was a former an American, an ex-naval veteran of World War II, 
who was from Texas, of all things. Um, so, and I'm thinking that might explain some of the, the subtext. And, um, and again, by the way, if you're, if you're you know, scandalized by this, just remember some of your favorite movies might have some of these elements in them in, in terms of the subtext. I'm thinking, by the way, just to give you one example, one of my favorite movies is Ben-Hur. <clears throat> if you don't know, Ben-Hur had to be rewritten in the middle of the filming because the, the script wasn't working. One of the people they brought in to rewrite the script was Gore Vidal. Gore Vidal was a novelist, um, uh, political commentator, very gay. Um, and he talked about when they rewrote the script, they didn't have enough conflict in it. So what they did was, if you remember Ben-Hur, Ben-Hur is the Jewish prince. He has the friend Masala who betrays him. They turned Masala into a character who acts like a jilted lover. And again, in real life, there's not that much difference between that and a, a friendship that goes bad. But again, there might be something of that in these plays. It doesn't really affect the film. And um, and so there might be something, again, maybe I'm, maybe I'm overdoing. Watch the film and decide for yourself. But after I watched it, I'm like, yeah, there might be something to this. And, um, and again, one of the weird things about this whole, again, they bring all this stuff in here, this, the, the, the ethnic stuff with the, Beckett being a Saxon, those sorts of things. Um, that may have been, again, may have been part of the actual relationship where Henry was someone who thought he could control this commoner. And then when he becomes archbishop, he, you know, finds he can't control him anymore. It becomes angry at him. And so maybe there's something like this. I mentioned this final scene uh, to move on from that for a second uh, that shows Henry regretful. Like there's a wonderful, it's a nice scene, by the way. He's, you know, praying. He's been whipped already, right? By monks uh, as part of his penance. And um, he, he goes out to the crowds. He proclaims Beckett to be a saint. He comes in, and he's been praying at his tomb, at his effigy. And um, one of the things he says, he basically tells his barons, we're going to find out who did this. He's like, well, we don't know who these people are. He's like, we'll find them. And kind of hinting he knows they did it. These are the same four barons in the movie. And uh, that he's going to make amends or something. And in fact, the last, the last scene's very nice, because he looks at his tomb after he proclaims him a saint and says... Is the, uh, is the honor of God washed clean enough? Are you satisfied now, Thomas? And then he walks out, and the last, last shot is of the king's all alone now. That's the thing he talks about throughout the film. It's like, oh, Beckett was the only person who understood me, and now I'm alone. All that has nothing to do with reality. <laughs> but it's a nice, it makes for the film, I think, a little more compelling, the relationship between those two men. And um, again, as a film, like it doesn't do a great job explaining the issues involved. I think, I think A Man for All Seasons did a better job um, than that. But on the other hand, I think it did a, a good job kind of getting the personalities of the men, <clears throat> um, their role in this, this event. Um, as I mentioned before, both of them are really headstrong and aggressive. And I think everyone agrees that this, might have, this could have been avoided, uh, the actual conflict uh, uh, in real life. And so the film might be, might be right about that. It might be right about it was this personal relationship rather than, say, <clears throat> ideals that sort of uh, led to this conflict. Um, but on the whole, I, I still think it's a, a worthy film. Uh, again, I take my, you know, my, my, my strictures about subtext with a grain of salt. Maybe I'm overdoing it. Uh, it doesn't really affect the film. And again, one of the best things about the film, you have to give the director credit for this, this is partly his doing, I'm, I'm sure, is that they did get the religion aspect right. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, and so that is our review of, of, uh, of uh, the film Beckett. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, what's upcoming on the podcast? Okay. Um, so I mentioned before I'm having, you know, writing things that I'm doing, writing projects. I'm going to slow down a little bit, try to get one out a week uh, going forward. I'll probably do another um, short podcast where I read something I've written. Uh, next one will be out for everyone will be the one on the Pearson Integrated Humanities Program. I know I've been promising this for months now. <laughs> I'm getting behind on stuff. i got to do some more reading, get that done, that'll be what out. And then after that will be the next uh, next episode uh, for our subscribers, actually the, for our subscribers in the series on Latinization, which will be on the Church of the East. Um, a couple weeks, yeah, it'll take two or three weeks to get that one done. Uh, for everyone else, the last episode, that, again, these episodes that are series, by the way, the episodes are dropped first for our patrons on Patreon. Then after a month, I release them to everybody else. That one will be coming up for everybody in a few weeks as well. And um, beyond that, I don't know. Um, one thing, uh, one of the reasons, by the way, I've been promising live stuff 
interviews and other sorts of things, live streams. The reason I haven't done it is because my internet sucks and it keeps going out all the time. So I'm having to I'm, I'm having to change internet, and once that get done, hopefully I'll be able to, be able to do some of that. Uh, hopefully have some guests on and do some stuff like that as well. So branch out a little bit if I can. So uh, with that, thank you everyone for listening. Really appreciate all the listeners. Hope you got something out of this. Please do watch the film, by the way. I really I like the film a lot, obviously, as you can tell. Um, and uh, please keep help spreading the word. You know, tell friends if you like it. Tell them uh, what, what was good about it and that uh, uh, the podcast. Uh, really appreciate that. Go like us on like our Facebook page. Follow us on Spotify, where we're uh, my host is Spotify, <clears throat> yeah, Apple Podcasts, um, everywhere else you can find it. Basically, it's available. Uh, you can visit our website. Um, hopefully, I have some new stuff on there. New stuff. Maybe do some new posts. I need to do some new posts on some of the things I've been thinking about lately. But go visit that. And find some more stuff up there. You'll find there, by the way, links to all my writings, uh, which is uh, Crisis Magazine. And mostly, but also one Peter five website uh, and a couple of things I published it inside the Vatican as well. Uh, also, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. I, I post eventually all the the stuff up there as well. Uh, the uh, podcasts. If I ever do anything live video, we'll do it through there as well. So that's that'll be a, a venue we do at some point. Um, Yes, and if you, if you want to become a patron, uh, go ahead and do so. Uh, very grateful to the ones we have. Not necessary. Uh, again, it's if you feel moved. Uh, I am not. I, I, by the way, I will repeat this pledge. I am not going to make a living off of this, so you don't have to worry about that. It will not be, you know, uh, by anything that I do. Because it won't be any thing I do for that. It'll just be on the side. It does help, by the way, a little bit defray some like advertising costs. I ran an ad in the National Catholic Register last month, so stuff like that. But I'm not going to make any money off of it. Uh, does motivate me, by the way. <laughs> you get paid. You want to do things all of a sudden. But uh, go like the podcast. Go subscribe to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. Uh, I do have ads on, on Spotify, so they give a little bit of money that way to help defray costs. But uh, forget all that. You can, you'll get it for free one way or the other. So uh, that, is my, that is my pledge. So anyway, thank you, everyone, for listening. God bless you all. Have a great week. And uh, hear, from you, hear from me next time. Take care. <laughs>